I've been delivering workshops for about 10 years now. Throughout that time, I've learned that crafting a workshop is actually an art form in of itself. So not only do you need to learn your craft, like for me, it's percussion. You also need to learn the craft of making a good workshop. So today I'm going to share seven practical tips and categories that you need to think about before delivering a session in the hopes that it makes life easier for you. I'm going to talk a little bit about each area and share with you some questions that I ask myself. Number one, think about your participants. Obviously, workshops don't happen without people attending them. Having an idea about what your target demographic is or who you're going to be working with and their needs is of the utmost importance. There are, of course, slight variables in that process. If you're being booked by a client to deliver a workshop to a certain community, whether that's a corporate environment or in a school or a charity that works with a specific demographic, it's going to be quite different between those. And then also it's completely different as well if you're running your own session and hoping that people come because then you need to consider who your target demographic is and how you're gonna get them through the door, which is another level of complexity. The questions I ask myself are, where are they coming from? Which community are they coming from? They come from all over a city. Are they coming from the same village as one another? What are their needs in terms of accessibility or support? Do they have additional support requirements like varying levels of autism? Do they have accessibility issues? And what level of experience do they have? Are they beginners? Are they professionals? Are they aspiring professionals? All of that is really important to consider. If you've been booked by a client to go deliver a session, then don't be afraid to ask those kinds of questions to the person who's booked you. Because ultimately having the answers to those questions are, is gonna allow you to do your best job, which is gonna give those people the best experience. Tip number two, thinking about the equipment. Depending on what type of work you're doing, you're gonna need different amounts of equipment from pens and paper if you're doing like a songwriting or poetry or writing workshop to what I do where I do group percussion sessions that involve you know anywhere from 10 to 60 people I need to have drums sticks straps because some kind of hearing protection for all those people it's really worth considering what equipment you need to deliver your session how suitable that equipment is for your group so like my favorite drum is over here this 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 bad boy and it's like 90 centimeters tall so like basically a meter if i'm working with some kids they're not gonna be able to play that properly so because it's simply too tall or a lot of the drums that i use are worn on straps not everyone can do that comfortably so how can i accommodate them questions i generally ask myself do i have enough equipment is it suitable for my participants where can i borrow rent buy more so for instance if you're working with a client or a venue they can probably provide some aspects of that. How am I going to transport all the equipment? You know, can I fit it all into a taxi or my backpack or do I have a car or a van? And do I need name stickers? Because for those of us who either teach a lot or have not the best memory for names, I'm both, uh, <laughs> name stickers are crucial in terms of just being able to remember names because people love hearing their own names and it just builds a bit of a connection between you and your participants. It's a lot better than saying you over there or what's her face. Category three, thinking about the space. The space I think is a often overlooked aspect of a delivery. Having the right amount of utility and vibe in a space is gonna make or break a workshop. If you're not happy with the vibe of the room as you enter, it's your space for the duration of your workshop. So feel free to change the layout of the room and. You know, if you need to ask permission, ask permission. So long as you put it back in the right place afterwards. So like we were running an after school club with an organization I used to work for, where we'd go in and it was just in one of the normal classrooms, but kids would come in and learn instruments there. And we wanted to practice in a circle, but obviously with all the tables and chairs in the middle of the room, we couldn't do it. So we just moved all the tables and chairs out of the way at the start of the session and back at the end. And we had a reference picture so we could never forget. So don't be afraid to like, change the layout of a room to suit your needs for that time because the room is yours for that time thinking about what people are going to experience as they walk in do you want to have a elaborate wall of all the drums that you've brought with you do you want background music on to get people in the mood that sort of thing questions i consider are there tables and chairs do i need tables and chairs how can i maximize the space to suit my activity is the space accessible for learners? Not only physically accessible in terms of like, is there a ramp, is there a lift? 
but also like where is it in relation to my participants? Is it accessible by public transport? Or do they need to have a car or a taxi? Am I working with a community that is in a specific neighborhood in my city or town and getting them to come to a central location or another neighborhood is that realistic? Is that accessible? Because geography can play a barrier to accessibility. Does the space have the amenities that I need? Can I bring anything from home to elevate the space? So I was running a residential course with Global Grooves and we were in just a kind of outdoor activity center where people go and like do hiking and that sort of thing for a week. And it wasn't the coziest of spaces in the common room. So we, the team would literally, we just bring lamps and fairy lights from our homes and just let them be in the space for the week just to give it a very different energy. And it just worked perfectly. Then number four, thinking about the material. Hopefully this is like the easiest part of this process. If it's not, don't panic. But what are you actually going to do with your group? And it's worth being really clear about what the function of the workshop is. What are you aiming to achieve? What are people hoping to get out of it? What are you hoping to give people out of it? In essence, why are people there and what are they going to learn? This part becomes easier the more you do it. So like I'm at the stage 10 years in where I don't have a solid plan of like, I know exactly everything I'm going to do. I've got an idea of how I start the sessions and then everything else is based on experience. Obviously the material you're doing can vary wildly depending on the scale of the session. So if you're doing a one day corporate session for a bank or something, that will be massively different to you working with a full academic, for a full academic year in a high school. There's just vastly different demands from that. When I first started, I was planning like every five minute interval for a one hour session. And I quickly realized that that's just not sustainable and not practical either because you're never going to live up to that. It's good to consider what you might do, but I wouldn't put time limits on each thing because then you get stressed about watching your clock rather than engaging with the people in the room. I'd suggest learning a wide variety of fun games to do with people. The reason being is that A, it can break the ice. If people are unsure of you as a facilitator, it's also good for you as a facilitator to like play a game to just take your mind off the, the nerves if you're new to this. It can bring the energy up, it can bring the energy down with a good game. And it can bring people out of their shell a bit in a way that makes them a bit more vulnerable, which might be more suitable for your session. For example, for every drumming session, I do some kind of game and then I do a rhythmic game where I clap something and they clap it back to me. Not only am I getting them to think rhythmically and getting them thinking about playing stuff together at the same time as everyone else, I'm also testing them and gauging what material that I've got in my toolkit is accessible to them. So if I know that they can't play some things back to me properly, then I'm not going to go for that kind of material. So questions I consider, what warm up will I deliver? Is the session material appropriate for the level of participants? Can I explain the material in clear, simple terms? How am I going to deliver this at the right pace? And how am I going to maintain the attention of the room? That's a biggie. Like getting used to holding the room's attention is, is key. And it's something that no two people do the same way. Some people are big facilitators and fill the room with like their voice and their presence and their energy. Some people are a little bit under more understated, which is also amazing. So exploring which type of teacher and leader you are is an important part of that journey. Tip number five, the practical stuff. This is the stuff that a lot of people find really dry and boring and it can be for sure, but it's really important to get right. Are you insured? Do you have first aid? Is there someone on site who has first aid? Have you got all the contracts in place? Do you have all the contact details of everyone you need? Are the deliverables clear? How long is the commute? Is there parking? That kind of thing. Other questions I ask myself and things that I think are worth considering in advance are the following. Tip number six, legacy. This is something, again, I think is overlooked a lot of the time. An individual workshop has the potential to literally change someone's life, which is an amazing thing and sort of forgotten about when you're focused on, oh, I'm gonna teach these people this drumming pattern 
for instance. So it's worth sitting down and taking some time to think about how are you going to capitalize on the positive energy that's come from your workshop? So some of the questions I think about in relation to this, uh, how can I document this experience? Am I going to take videos? Am I going to take photos? Am I going to do feedback forms, reviews? Do I want to remain accessible to this group? Do I want them to have like my social media handles or my email address or know what my website is so that I can continue to engage with them? Do I want them to have access to this YouTube channel do, so that they can continue to learn from me also for free? And how could I continue to engage them? So like if I do a session and it goes really well, I think, oh, well, is there a way that I can do more sessions with them? Is there a way that I can advertise to them for the independent classes that I'm running to get them to come along. I think the legacy part is something that's worth considering if you want your career to develop in the world of delivering education and delivering workshops. And last but by no means least, the seventh tip is all about flexibility. This aspect of teaching workshops, even 10 years in, is the thing that keeps humbling me over and over again. Remaining open, to whatever can happen in the room. Sure, it's all well and good for us to think a lot about what's gonna happen in advance. But actually, when you get there, something could just knock that whole plan out of the window. Mike Tyson put it best. Everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. Like I said earlier with that example, I would plan out every minute, but of course I'm working with people. So like, it's not gonna go that way. People might have questions and that might derail things, which is great. Or you go there and the material actually doesn't work and you need to switch it on the fly. You'll have good days and you'll have bad days. Some workshops will do really well. Some workshops will not do so well. And that's okay. It's part of the ebbs and flows of these things. We can do our best to get everything in advance, but sometimes you just don't know who you're teaching until they arrive. For example, I literally had this a few weeks ago. I was teaching for a client who organizes school trips for international schools. And I had a group of kids. I didn't know where they were going to be from. I just knew that I had 30 kids coming from somewhere. And I was going to teach them drumming, which was great. They turn up and it's 30 kids from an international school in the Middle East. Great. Not only that, there was an interesting percentage of people that were into it or not. Like a third were really into it. A third really couldn't care less. And another third were it's kind of going with the flow, which was cool. What added to the complexity with this was the fact that they'd had a really rough travel. So they were all exhausted from their travel day the day before. Not only that, but the ones who were really excited about it made a request. I've never had a request at a workshop, but, but they asked if I knew this Brazilian song because I teach Brazilian percussion. They're like, oh, do you know this song by Ana? I'm like, yeah, I know that. And started playing it and singing it. And they were like, oh, we need to learn this song. And I was like, oh my God, this song is very difficult. So I had to improvise. I put the speaker that I had with me on the ground and we listened to it together. And I just used everything in my toolkit to make something that sounded at least a little bit like Bayana by Barbara Tokis. <laughs> and it sounded great in the end, but it was probably about an hour into the two and a half hours I had with them, they were like, oh yeah, no, we've got this basic beat down. I want to like learn Bayana. I'd already gotten them playing and the use of the drums and then we had to switch. And my plan went out the window and that was okay. It was stressful at first, um, but I think actually owning that in front of your participants is a really good thing also. Staff were not only impressed with how they sounded at the end, but also just the fact that I'd had to, I completely switched my plan to accommodate what they wanted to get out of it and that it worked. Hopefully this helps you in your journey in delivering workshops. If it was useful, please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Let me know what type of sessions you're delivering. If you wanna learn more about delivering workshops and or world percussion, then this channel is the right place for you. <laughs> I am terrible at this call to action stuff. But yeah, if you wanna stick around, I'd really appreciate it. And until the next video, see you.